being with the discomfort of it, being with the disease of it and saying there is something in that for me to experience authentically, vulnerably, to be vulnerable to it, in that perhaps something about the inversion will find its way right side up. Welcome to Sora Mystica, a podcast exploring life's mysteries and magic through its symbols. I'm Mariana Lewis, an archetypal tarotist. And I'm astrologer Christina Farella. And just as the Soror Mystica guided the alchemist through his holy work, we hope to be your mystic sisters in these conversations, guiding you deeper into the symbolic life. Hey everybody, this is the 41st episode of Sora Mystica, and today we are talking about reversals and retrogrades because we have some special stuff going up, going on in the, in the sky, right? We have entered a retrograde. Mm-hmm. Mercury um, retrograde starts today and we're wonderful. shooting this on August 4th, so yep, it's here. Hooray! Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and uh, reversals is always something that I love talking about and discussing. So we're going to kind of blend those two sides of our modalities and, and discuss it. So that's really cool. And um, I have two quick announcements. The first one is that I think in our last episode, maybe we we mentioned our next book of the book club. And Christine and I actually have both have very big projects that we're working on right now. And we're like, hmm. It's summer and we always take on too much. Maybe we're going to take a little bit of a hiatus for just like a month or so. So we're going to push that back a little bit. So if you were thinking about joining the book club, just wait a month and then join us sometime in September and we'll see you there. Um, That's the first thing. And the second thing is that I actually am launching the Archetypal Tarot School again, which is very, very cool. And a lot of people have been asking when its doors are opening again, and here they are. So now is your chance to join this really, really cool program. Um, The Archetypal Tarot School, if you haven't heard about it before, is my 10-week sort of signature class that I I teach um, for you know, it's not a total, total beginner class. If you've like just gotten your first deck, this is not really the class for you. I do offer a bundle package where I have a total beginner class that you can kind of like get and watch and, and sort of like binge that and then jump into the Archetypal Tarot School. But it's for people who really want to take their tarot study deeper. Like they really want to find the depth in it. They really want to find the wisdom. So we read the cards through a depth psychological lens, um, through the lens of psyche. And we talk about all sorts of really, really interesting things like how synchronicity works with the tarot and archetypal numerology and the tarot and the hero's journey. And of course we move through all of the cards with a lot of depth and, and looking at all the archetypal elements that go into them. We talk about reading techniques. Um, just, it's a really, really rich course. So, and it's just my favorite thing to teach people. So I'm excited for it. And I hope that if you have any questions, you let me know and maybe I'll see you there. And there's going to be a link somewhere in our in our show notes for that. So that's my announcement. And we're starting um, September 8th, I believe, is our orientation. So this week of September 9th is, our, is the first week that uh, that we're starting. So, so I will see some people there, I hope. So enough of that. Um, tell me what you're reading, Christine. Are you reading anything? No. Giving yourself any time to read anything? I'm – no, I'm reading stuff. Um... I'm, and for everyone who's like wondering what's wrong with me, I'm moving and I'm also. <laughs> what's also, wrong with you? <laughs> yeah. I'm, uh, I have a lot on my plate. I'm moving and I'm also getting married. She's getting September. married. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is very exciting and very fun. And also, I have an Italian dad and he's, <laughs> he's, <laughs> he has, he has high standards. He's my party planner. <laughs> he is your party planner. And he's very cute. And so it, there's just like a lot, there's a lot going on, which is, mm-hmm. it's good. It's a good time, but um, yeah. Moving I'm, cross country and getting married in the same three yeah, weeks. We've so. been in Oregon for seven years, mm-hmm. uh, which is a quarter of a Saturn cycle, which is super interesting to me astrologically. And it has been, really important for me to be out here and like grow yeah. and be a person yeah. and learn things about life. And now mm-hmm. we're going back to where I'm from and um going to 
start a new chapter. So Mm -hmm. I just can't understand how I'm going to dig us out of all of our books (laughs) and all of the cute rocks and seashells I have collected for no reason. Problem with being a witch. (laughs) It's really bad. And then like my tea collection, like what's happening with that? These are the, these are the questions that I am contemplating. Um, But anyway, so yeah, I'm a little bit um, scattershot, I think is the word, but that's fine. Um, I'm reading a book called The Unforgivables, which is a collection of essays by Christina Campo. Yeah, it's so good. Um, It's kind of like something that I think every, every person who wants to write creative essays should read this book because it's such a beautiful model of how to write on interesting philosophical topics like mythology and fairy tales and just literature in general but she writes with a really really poetic uh kind of eye and she's not necessarily making arguments even though she kind of is um but it's more of like a kind of um poetic performance unto itself each piece so it's very cool when you get to new york you'll lend it to me because Mm -hmm. i'm i'm looking for good inspiring material Yes. Um, it's the kind of thing that you read and you're like, oh, I want to write now. That's yeah, kind yeah, of exactly. like the, the fodder for the imagination that it is. So That's how I felt after reading um, The Flowering Wand, Sophie mm-hmm. Strand's book. I was like, oh, yeah, there's like something to style. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. nice. It's like an idea. It's like how to write pretty things that are also potent. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that you in particular would also really like Christina Campo. She was um, – she was uh, – she is Italian. She's an Italian writer. She lived in Rome for most of her life. And she was, I believe that she was writing in like the seventies, maybe the sixties. And, um, she was really into the occult. And then in the middle of her life had some kind of, um, super like, uh, religious kind of, she had one of the Christian. Yeah, she did. She did. And so she's like super into Christ consciousness, but she's also still very, you know, involved with, the yeah. mythic and I can just tell that she's your kind of girl so mm-hmm. you should definitely read her it's so interesting I saw someone on Instagram recently I, I have to like I don't remember who it was but someone like was was trying to break down th- what happens in that it is like a thing I oh, think that a lot of people go so far into the occult that they suddenly have what Jung calls the enantiodromia, which we might actually talk about. We should definitely do an episode <laughs> in this episode. Yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> we could That's, probably talk yeah. about it today. <laughs> um, and it, in which she just kind of totally flipped to the opposite, and it, it is a very interesting. Uh, it's a very interesting phenomenon that I mean, Pamela Smith did it herself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She had a, a Catholic uh, conversion towards the end of her life, and and renounced the tarot. And renounced her work on the tarot. At that least. is she, so I don't, sad. I don't and think she so... ever really cared about the tarot, but she, she was, her she was, yeah, yeah, she was very interested in the project, obviously. Mm. Um, so, but anyway, um, that's cool. I'm very excited to read that after you're done with it, or whenever you decide to take a yeah. break, and I can steal it from you. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I'm actually doing a lot of reading right now. I'm reading the um, Archetypal Imagination by James Hollis, which I think I picked picked mm-hmm. up in Oregon with you. Um, I think you did. at your little bookstore mm-hmm. fireplace. Um, and it is so good. I really, really freaking love this book. It's very, um, James Hollis is a really well-known and respected union and he, it's, it's also very creative. Um, and this is, has nothing like, I did not know this before I started reading it, but the last chapter I read was on the archetypal imagination and basically just on Rilke and how mm-hmm. these two things and Rilke is my favorite poet so I was like oh my god it's it's fate mm-hmm. um so I've been really really enjoying that and I also just picked up to the lighthouse oh because love, I, love I wanted to be I'm reading a lot of bad fiction fantasy fiction because I like fantasy but then I I commit to things that I are terribly written because I I can't not I, I committed, so I have to do it. So I'm like, this is where we differ. I, this I is very, where we differ. No, thank you. <laughs> I know, I know. I wish I could. I'm like, ah. Oh. So now it's three and a half books into something I hate, um, and I, I'm just like, I need something real. So I am. It's hard because I feel like I'm reading it 
I'm so oversaturated with such nonsense that to then like find the severity, or not the severity, but like the concentration needed to read Virginia Woolf is mm-hmm. being a bit of a challenge. But when I do fall into it, then I'm like, oh, this is so cool. She, that book so, in particular, yeah. I'm like, I had like a serious obsession with in college and I oh. like wrote a paper about that I felt like was one of my good college papers, but um, it's super moving and it is really hard and it is about. Um, I only, yeah. I'm only 40 pages in, so I don't, I'm still getting used to the flipping of perspectives and different people's thoughts and, yep. and trying to figure out who's who. Yeah, how many children there are <laughs> doing a lot of that like okay wait <laughs> concentrate be, it's be present great. yeah i mean it felt like a good summary one because it mm-hmm. seems beach oriented so i was like yeah. why not let's let's go for that so i hope that i can i can uh get out of my my agitated brain enough to to really be present with it but so far i'm i'm committing yeah <laughs> i'm commit committing a bit She's an Aquarius, so you know she speaks to your Aquarius just, rising. And I'm just so used to like, what did you say to me? <laughs> she stomped across the hall. Oh my god! She looked at him and stuck out her tongue. <laughs> I'm like, why am I reading? This Get out of nonsense? there, Mariana! <laughs> I can't live here. <laughs> so, um, we're talking about reversals and retrogrades. Mm-hmm. We can probably jump in with retrogrades since this is the most pressing thing. Um, going on right now, we have our, our Mercury retrograde coming up right when we all want it to. Um, always takes us by surprise, even though we always know it's coming. Um, and it can, it's something that there's a lot of terror about out there. And yeah. I think that that's silly. Um, but you can, you can talk us through a little bit more about your thoughts. It's on a very weird thing that there yeah. is terror about it. But I, I really blame like 2010's internet culture for that because in like 2012 when there started to be this big internet boom around astrology again um everyone was like looking for a kind of way to get clicks <laughs> and like yeah, yeah. you know what's the hook here oh this period of time is going to really mess you up and um it just became this kind of urban legend thing that mercury retrograde is like the worst transit ever and I can assure you there are far worse transits than Mercury retrograde. I, I did book my tickets for my honeymoon. Instead of going from Paris to London, I went from London to Paris oh, and found that out at the train station. So I will say that that does that it can mess that you sucks. up a little bit. <laughs> no, so I'm not here to say it's fine. I'm yeah. not saying it's okay. I'm saying it is a time where we have to double check our it's tickets. not it's yeah. not doom you have to double mm-hmm. check your tickets. Yeah. no but i would rather mercury retrograde than like a mars uranus conjunction like that seems scary to me anyway so it's a funny thing to kind of reframe um and so i'll give a little bit of information about the particular retrograde that we're approaching or kind of in right now and then um talk about why we can uh sort of like reapproach this issue. So basically, for everyone listening, Mercury is going to be going retrograde today, August 4th through August 28th. And he'll be retrograde from, he'll be moving backwards basically um, from six degrees Virgo to 22 degrees Leo. And so if you've got planets within 22 Leo to six Virgo, you're going to be feeling some of that um, energy. But what this really means is that, you know, Mercury is the planet that governs communication, message transmission, cognition, teaching, reading, writing, travel, mm-hmm. emails, texts. Like we live in a very Mercury oriented world. Yeah. And this is why Mercury retrograde can tend to suck so much because he is, um, you know, his themes are getting a little bit of a pause or a little bit jumbled. And yeah. so, it's a kind of time where we're supposed to be um, stepping back from pushing forward, right? And I think that uh, for all of us now, we live in a world that also expects us to be moving forward at like a breakneck pace. And mm-hmm. we are constantly comparing ourselves to other people and we're constantly comparing ourselves to our own expectations. And a lot of those expectations are kind of like not human and not really yeah. you know, healthy and stuff like that. And so we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to create and to push and to like show up all the time. And I personally really like the idea that planetary retrograde can be a time of taking a break and stepping back because we really need to and really we deserve to. Yep. So I like to say it's kind of corny, but like when we have 
retrogrades, we do RE words. And this is not my idea. This actually comes from another astrologer named Anne Orderly, who is um, a wonderful kind of like elder astrologer in the New York astrology community. And she, um, yeah, I, I read this on her blog a long time ago. We do RE things. So we retrace our steps. We reflect, we remember, we reassess, we recognize, we whatever, fill in the blank. We do all of these mm-hmm. things because we're supposed to be kind of going back in time a little bit and digesting everything that's happened to right. us over the past several months since Mercury's last retrograde. Yeah, so, moving back in the spiral a little bit. Exactly, right? Yeah. So the planets, if you can imagine it, are always like moving around the wheel in a circle shape. And at a certain point in time, due to the speed of the Earth versus the speed of Mercury, there is this kind of optical illusion thing that happens in Mercury's retrograde where it looks like Mercury is moving backwards in the sky in right. terms of its zodiacal position. Uh, but that is not true. That is an optical illusion just due to some differential in like the orbital speed. And so since <laughs> astrology is so much based on this idea of sympathy, where we are looking to the macrocosm and we're looking to nature to see what's up, um, you know, and like is supposed to equal like, ancient astrologers believe that when a planet looked like it was moving backwards in the sky, so too would the themes of whatever that planet was attached to would also kind of be stagnant or moving backwards. And that was negative for them. That was a malefic implication. So, you know, it's definitely not the best time to try to start stuff, but sometimes we have no choice in life, but to start something during a retrograde. And so we might find ourselves having to restart parts of it later down the line but it's not um, it's not a terrible thing to have to kind of do that. So I thought, you know, when we were trying to think of, um, you know, our next topic, I thought that this would be an interesting idea because the idea of uh, reversal, inversion, retrograde, just kind of anything that is about um, not pushing forward explicitly on the path right. Right. is something that we do work with in both of our modalities. And it's something that we all as a collective, I think, really need to accept as a necessary piece of whatever path that we're working Mm -hmm. towards. Like any kind of individuation story is not just, and then I did this and then I did this and then I did this, right? There's always a moment in like a fairy tale or a movie where, you know, you can't cross the bridge. So you have to double back and you have to go around the mountain or something like that. And that is um, just natural in the phase or in the kind of uh, process of, achieving any kind of goal. So for individuation and just for like life stuff, what happens when we kind of embrace the retrograde or the um, yeah. the reversal or the inversion for what it is. So that is what's up over here. And yeah, lots, lots of ideas. So yeah. I think it's really important. I'm, I'm a little bit, uh, I'm, a, I don't know, you know, I don't, Leo season makes me weird. As mm-hmm. I've told you many times, I don't, mm-hmm. I don't know exactly what it is. I always get a little bit bitchier. Um, and I just have a lot less patience for the world. So I'm, I'm kind of in this mental headspace where I'm like, I'm really over people trying to figure things out and pretend like they know what they're doing and moving forward. Maybe mm-hmm. that's perfect timing for Mercury retrograde coming into place. Um, and I think that we, this is why we often try to engage with spirituality um is because we were just like well how do i how do i just be correct and do everything correctly and do everything the way it's supposed to be done and and move forward nicely and and make it nice and neat and all this stuff and i'm finding myself currently just like very very cynical with this <laughs> concept um and this like impetus that we have as a society because no one does that everything is messy um, and everything is meant to be relearned. Um, and nothing is ever, I don't even know if anything is ever fully learned until we actually are presented the challenge again and have to find out whether we've learned something a little bit. Like, mm-hmm. you know, this idea of like, well, what I get this, I'm sure you get this a lot too. Um, as a tarot reader, I get all the time people saying, well, what was the lesson in this bad thing that happened to me? And, you know, I, I want to help them figure it out. And I'm curious about it too, but I also have seen this so many times that there's a big part of my, maybe it's, it's my more kind of, you know, analytical Aquarian side of my brain. That's like, but is there, 
is there a lesson in the bad thing that happened or is it just that something was changed and alchemized in you that you will see when it again comes to pass or it again comes up on, on the spiral of, of the individuation. Like you might not sit there and go, ah, oh, <laughs> here's what it was. And therefore I don't have to suffer through this again. So I think that moments of retrogrades are really good opportunities to, to allow things to get messy and to find, you know, what in me is more prepared for this, this time what in me is less prepared this time? What did I fail at Some somewhere in the on this journey that I didn't get and I need to more consciously get? Like, it's a time to ask questions mm-hmm. um, about ourselves and also be allowed to be mad that the universe sucks. And occasionally, I, every time I have, every email I send gets messed up some t- somehow in Mercury. Like, every time, every time. And I, I, it's always like, I'll voice note Christina and I'll be like, I don't know why this keeps happening. And she'll be like, it's Mercury retrograde, you know? And I'm like, what? <laughs> Damn it. I did it again. I forgot again. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> and I'm like, well, that's fine. Okay. So I can accept it and just like, let it be messy. Um, I want to talk about you know, with, with retrogrades and reversals is very much a similar thing in tarot. People are very scared of reversals in, in the tarot. And I always tell, tell, you know, people that they're not necessary. They're really not. I think that they're so useful. I think that they are so illuminating when you're a beginner, they can be very overwhelming. So I usually don't recommend people just jump in with them because they're like, Oh, what does this mean? We panic. We freak out when we see an inversion. Um, but when once you get your bearings a little bit and you have a little bit more comfort with the cards and they don't terrify you as much if you get the Ten of Swords or something, you're not like, oh, my God, am I going to die? You know, like and you can like chill out for a sec. Then inversions can be so, so helpful. And in, in Mary Greer says um, reversals allow us to see from the other side. That's mm-hmm. that's the point of them. We are looking at it it from a whole different perspective. And she actually has a really beautiful quote from her book, um, I think like 21 Ways to Read Reversals or something. Mm-hmm. She Mary Greer has a series of books. It's like 21 ways to read such and such. So I think she has one on reversals, court cards, and just, I think, just tarot cards in general. So they sound like they're going to be just like basic books, but, the, but Mary Greer has very high – um, level of scholarship and everything she does in talking about the tarot. So very highly recommend that book. It's great. Um, and she says in this like little introduction um, that, first of all, that all reversals belong to the realm of the hanged man, which I agree with um, archetypally. She says, to reverse adversity, we suspend ourselves from cosmic consciousness represented as a living tree on the hanged man card by realizing that all circumstances are particular encounters of spirit with soul. This changes our concepts of the source of pain and the reasons we are subjected to it. The real I can do no wrong. Every adversity is an opportunity for gathering wisdom and understanding, for it is only experience that cures our ignorance. So the idea basically is that when we, we are in our the ego, the idea of the ego, the I, she's saying, can do no wrong. And that's how we have to live our lives. We have to live our lives as the hero who does no wrong. So hence why... We get into a fight with someone and we're like, well, because they're like this and they do that thing. And so this is like, this is why I responded that way because of them, right? So it's the I can do no wrong thing um, that we all are victim to. And so we have to reverse the adversity. We have to see it from the other side. We have to suspend our ego consciousness for a moment to, to look up at the situation rather than like struggling to find our footing in it. And I think that that's, what reversals allow us to do. They allow us to, you know, we see the uh, three cups reversed and we go, oh, three cups, how sweet. Like I'm happy and I have great friends around me and whatever. And then we see the reversal of it and we go, oh my God, (laughs) are my friends going to tell me I'm terrible or something? What's going to happen? And instead the question is, well, how, how happy and sweet is this friendship I have going on? Are there, are there themes under the surface here that I'm ignoring are there tensions that I don't want to acknowledge? Am I playing a part in something feeling in in some feeling of adversity here and and questioning what that 
might be. So it's, they're very, very, very useful. And I actually, in my, in the Archetypal Tarot School, I talk about four or five different ways that we can approach them and, and think of them and not just this like opposite stupidness that is completely too limited. Um, but, but yeah, they're, they can, they can let us, I like to say they shift the shadows, mm. the shadows where they were before all of a sudden they clear and they're somewhere else. And so we can see something that we didn't quite see before. Mm-hmm. It's beautiful. I think that, um, something that I've learned from you is like the, you know, reversal being a kind of, um, you know, like if we pull a card and say, you know, we pull like, I don't know, the Empress reversed or something like Mm -hmm. that. I think with uh, tarot students, there's this anxiety of like, oh no, now I have to learn two meanings for each card because the inverted version means something different than the upright version. And what you pointed out to me, which is like so smart, is that actually the um, the reversed card is just kind of like this maybe inwardly held or kept in shadow aspect of that card, um, like yep. you were just saying. And I think that that is really something that made um, my own tarot practice like click and yep. feel like less pressure to understand every single facet of what does it mean to reverse or invert the card. It's not that we're yep. negating the qualities of it. It's just that it's kind of kept in a little bit of a shadow space that requires deeper excavation. And it's also can be, it can be comforting. It's like you're yep. still holding this archetype, but it's not yet outwardly expressed. And there's a little bit of work to do to understand how to make contact with it. So I yep. think it's kind of cool, gives you a little bit of homework, um, you know, and so yep. when we have like retrograde planets, it's the same thing. People will be born with planets retrograde in their natal chart. I only care about Mercury, uh, Venus, and Mars being retrograde. The social planets and the outer planets being retro, they're retro half the year. So I don't yeah. care. It's not that rare to me to see that in a natal chart, but yeah. especially with Venus and Mars retrograde, that's like a biggie. Um, but, you know, we think of Mercury retrograde as a time of like bad communication and bad, you know, things happening with words. And if you have Mercury retrograde in your chart, oh, no, maybe you can't communicate. Well, guess what, guys? I have Mercury retrograde in my <laughs> chart and I write up a storm. <laughs> very, very. And good. I love to teach and I don't have like anxiety about uh, I have other anxieties, but I actually don't have any anxiety about sharing information. So it doesn't mean that you don't hold that power anymore because of that placement. It actually means that there's a unique approach that you're supposed to be taking to understand how that planet functions in your psyche and in your chart. So instead of being like, oh, Mercury retrograde is going to mess this person up and they're not going to be able to communicate in relationships. It's like, actually, maybe this person really needs a lot of time alone to read and think. Maybe this person actually needs to have their imagination nourished or their intellect nourished and challenged by their primary caregivers when they're a child or something like that. So there's a lot of stuff that can come up around, again, the the strength and the vitality of that placement is still there, but there are different techniques to approaching it and integrating it that, um, again, it's kind of like a queering of the meaning of the thing. It's like we're going outside of the norm or the mainstream approach to love or communication or, you know, anger or whatever the planet is symbolizing. And I think that can be very liberating too, to think that we don't have to do it this kind of like, you know, A plus B plus C equals D manner uh, in terms of understanding ourselves. So um, I like to hold that a little bit with my chart work. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's great. I think it's, I think that one of the best ways to begin with doing any kind of inner work, if you're, if you're trying actively to do that is to find these points of retrogrades and reversals and start there. Because those are the the points where, you know, as as Mary Greer said in that quote, like there's there's a pain point, and then that's kind of the doorway in. Um, I think that's a Rumi quote, right? Like the pain is the the wound is the place the light enters, or whatever. The idea is that it is through a a weakened place that we can get illumination. Um, mm-hmm. Is that we can dig in a little bit because if we think about it psychologically, anywhere where the ego is bolstered and barricaded and set in its ways, we're not really going to get very far. But if we find any of those soft spots, those proverbial weaknesses, then there's maybe something to learn there that'll be a little bit more accessible. One of the things she says in this book too, is that like, 
it's through our diseases, you know, putting like a dash, dis, and eases. It's through these diseases that we have that we say, ah, oh, well, there's the point of the reversal. Like there's, there's the thing you were supposed to learn. Um, I just, I had a, um, I did a reading for myself. I don't read for myself very often, but I did a couple weeks ago and I pulled the, uh, the eight of wands inverted in this like place, like above me, kind of like a higher calling place. And I was like, oh, yuck, <laughs> don't love that. And it, I didn't have an immediate thing of like, oh yeah, that's because I have writer's block or blah, blah, blah. I mean, like, sure, I guess I could maybe, but I had to sit with it for a second and be like, yeah, that is an icky feeling for me to sit in it. And the, I looked at the card and I hated it. But the thing I noticed is that I already had the icky feeling inside of me. It didn't just come from seeing the card. I was like, oh, ugh, yeah, there it is. It's there. It's already there. And now the card has drawn that immediately forward. And I don't necessarily know, oh, well, this is what it means now, capital M means, and therefore this is the thing I must do to solve the inversion. It's the challenge is far more ick, like just being with the ick of it and being with the discomfort of it, being with the disease of it and saying there is something in that for me to experience authentically mm -hmm. and, and vulnerably, to be vulnerable to it in that perhaps something about the inversion will find its way right side up. And that's what I always, you know, do with my clients is whenever I see inversions, I'm like, okay, good. We have something to start with. <laughs> like this is the, you want to know what to do or how you can move yourself forward. We're going to start right here with this, you know, ace of wands inverted. We're going to start right here where it seems like it's the most uncomfortable thing to sit with because that's where we can give you points of entering where it's stickiest, most uncomfortable, most, um, you know, just the murkiest. Mm -hmm. And that's where we can find the most illumination for how to move forward. So I find them to be, <clears throat> you know, very illuminating in that way. Um, and not something that we want to over intellectualize either I warn people highly against over intellectualizing any of these kinds of things, because that's again, the ego just trying to take away the discomfort, um, rather than letting it be, a uh, a, a somatic experience, uh, a feeling experience. I, I think actually like this is a tangent, but we're going to go. Um, I think that we're a society that has way over emphasized the thinking function because we're, you know, post enlightenment mm -hmm. thinking function is yeah. king, right? And it's the most objective um, function and it's the it's closest to the ego realm. I really think so. The ego being like, I know this, I have perceived these things, I have these judgments and they're, they're uh, supported by the fact that society has these same judgments and my country tells me these are the same laws that I think are correct, et cetera, et cetera. And so we're in this very moralistic society, which comes from the thinking function. And our society feels like we're almost moving toward back towards Puritanism and Victorianism in many mm -hmm. ways, even if it's opposite values that were at the time. We still have these very rigid set of moralistic values in society. It's very thinking function stuff. Mm -hmm. And I find that most of the work that we need to do with my clients, probably collectively, is located in these inferior functions. It's located in the feeling function where we can sense what are my personal values, what's personally experienced within myself. Um, and then, of course, the intuitive and the sensation function, these other two sides of the psyche, the sensation function being connected to body and soma, which is so repressed. And then the intuitive side also being so nonsensical and not based in data and not based in, in reality. But of course, you know, we push that away. Um, and so I, I feel like it's, it's so much of this work of inversions are also getting in touch with these other senses that are totally not analytical and thinking oriented that are other places because they're often the most suppressed mm -hmm. just generally. Um, but that's a, a, that's a tangent, but it's no, just I love a thought. That idea. I, I love that. I think that's very smart. And yeah, so it's like, you know, because we live in this kind of logos oriented world, we think that we're supposed to be moving forward. We are always yeah, hearing yep, things yep. about making progress, making, you know, strides, achieving goals, hitting benchmarks and stuff. And like, yeah, there can be importance in that for having, um, especially if you are 
a creative person or you work for yourself or you just have goals that you want to achieve in your life, like, yeah, that's important to be able Mm -hmm. to stride forward. But that's the only thing we ever emphasize. We don't really emphasize um, or celebrate the experience of like the reversal of course or yeah. the changing of the mind or even the temporary failure, the temporary setback. Um, and we glamorize the kind of achievement of the ultimate goal yeah. over everything else that goes into it. And so I think that um, that gives a lot of us a ton of anxiety and it creates yeah. a lot of mental illness oh <laughs> in God. the world because yes. we're just like, we know we think, oh, I'm I'm supposed to have achieved X, Y, Z things by the time I'm 34. And actually, no, you're not, babe. You have a whole natal chart that you're supposed to be living through. And (laughs) a whole chart. And it's yours. Just waiting for you. (laughs) It's yours and it's unique and there's no set map. And so that's why stuff like astrology and tarot can be great for discerning and finding and breaking away from these rote cultural narratives of what progress and achievement looks yeah. like. And it's yeah. important, just like planets are retrograde all throughout the year, to remember that you also get to have your own retrograde phase of life. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So. I, it just made me think this you said that so well. And it's like we use these tools to support the things we're trying to break away from without mm-hmm. realizing it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's so a it, way of rewriting your own story. So yeah. It requires a big paradigm shift. Um, and I, I I think, too, that the idea of an ontodromia we can bring in a little bit because it is a really interesting idea. So um, an ontodromia is actually – it's a, a term that's popularized by Jung but comes from Heraclitus. And it means to, to like, run a course in, like, like to, to – um, let's see. Right, yeah, opposite. So the word enantios means opposite, and then the dromia comes from like running a course. So it's mm-hmm. to run a course in the opposite direction, right? Yeah. So it's very much attached to this idea of of retrograde and reversal. And it's an interesting theory because what Jung suggested is that when we become too one sided, when we become too fixated in one side of the psyche, the psyche will try to naturally compensate for that one-sidedness by reversing to its opposite, by bringing in this compensatory experience or function. So what that looks like, for example, is um, somebody might be um, really, really spiritual, having like a big spiritual awakening, like super airy fairy up in the air everything is like not real and all of a sudden like break their foot (laughs) and then just be like every day is like the stupid little things of like my foot is swollen in this position and I can't walk and I need to take pain relievers and blah blah and the idea is that there's this psychic flip to from one extreme of like I'm not in my body I'm I'm the spiritual person having this spiritual experience to all of a sudden being super super in the body, corporeal, worrying about the, the nitty gritty of, of just dealing with an injury kind of a thing. Um, <clears throat> and so what's one of the ra- ways I sometimes read reversals less often than other ways, less often than seeing them as energies that are in shadow, repressed, in flux, you know, all these things that just more shadowy in, in nature. But sometimes um, we can flip to the opposite and we do that all the time. Um, and sometimes it's good. Sometimes it is a, it's the, that compensation of the psyche is good and natural and it is really well served. Um, and sometimes it's really not. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so it's, it's up to us to kind of, with the ideas that we're trying to rebalance our psyche from being too one-sided. Um, so the, one of the cards that I see this happen all the time with is the star card. Um, because the star card is one that's really, really full of hope, but it's more than hope. It's like that unnameable, I'm special, something, but there's a destiny for me feeling that's very private and very true, but can get very inflated too. It can feel very big. It can feel like, but where's my destiny? Why isn't it happening? Um, and so when I am with a client and they pull the star inverted, I'm also often like, did we suddenly flip to the despair of I'm worthless? There's no hope for me. Nothing good is ever going to happen to me. Am I just start stuck in this dark pit? So we went from this hope that felt like it was, 
you know, enormous archetypal to this despair that feels like I'm like, there's no point in life. Why even try the cynicism that that inverted star can, can represent. Um, and so we can see that sometimes happen to ourselves. And it's important to, when, when we have this sudden flip, understand that we're trying to find some kind of equilibrium, even yeah. though it's, it's sometimes throws us way into the other deep end of, of stuff <laughs> that's too much, but, but, questioning rather than just getting stuck in it, questioning like, okay, well, is this part of me trying to restabilize myself? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's part of the, um, the drama of figuring our stuff out is that we have to like really go from one extreme to another. And I think that <clears throat> that's a, another good reminder of that all important tension of opposites or the yeah. kind of dialectical opposition of things that helps us find that magical third way. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that in finding our path reversed or our card position inverted, we are shown something about the opposite experience that helps us actually gain yep. some wisdom about what we need to do. Like, you know, one of the ways that I help my students make sense of the signs is to remind them that the sign gives us information about itself because of its qualities, but we also learn a lot about what the sign does from the sign that's opposite to it. Yeah. You know, Virgo and Pisces occupy an access, access together um, right. of like healing, but we learn something about quote healing from Virgo's perspective opposed to Pisces and where's the middle ground. That's actually the most balanced perspective on healing that we can find between those two signs. So I think that that's very important. And, um, that always strikes me as like so obvious when I think about it, but then, you know, it's so hard to get comfortable being in that space yeah. of, uh, of accepting the opposite thing. Like that's when you're going through something horrible, the last thing you want to hear from somebody is like, well, maybe you should just do it differently. Maybe you're not supposed to be approaching it with this, you know, energy, maybe actually do the opposite and see what happens. That's like the worst thing to hear in the world. Yeah. But it's actually kind of true that there's some wisdom in it of course maybe that person's being insensitive or maybe it's not the time like we have to be careful when we're delivering advice to people but yeah there is a lot of wisdom in saying how about what if you didn't do it this way what if you what if you opened up a new pathway in your imagination about how this goes um yeah you know and so i think that one of the places i was trying to think of myths where people get like inverted or turned around. And I don't, if a listener has an example, uh, I'm all eyes yeah. and ears about this. I if we had Alyssa Polizzi here, she'd pull out something she in would half know. a second. Alyssa's so smart. <laughs> she would know. And I think that, um, you know, fairy tales also feel like they have more of like a re reversal of course kind of thing. Yes. Um, but I can, you know, offer, um, you know, obviously, I think the labyrinth myth has a lot. Uh, there's like a reversal being of twisted around, yeah, in there. Mm -hmm. um, and also, um, Apuleius's novel, The Golden Ass, is a mm. kind of it's like it's a Manipian satire, so it's kind of like a slapstick folk story. Well, there's there's Orpheus too. He looks backwards. That is true. That is he true. He just kind of reverses perspective for a second, loses oh, everything though. That's tragic. Great. Right? So that's like, and yeah, we were thinking, you know, Sisyphus gets uh, up to the top of his hill with his boulder and he and then he just to gets crushed. Down. Lot's so wife does the same thing. She gets turned to salt because she looks right? back. So, okay. So actually it's really interesting. So we see in stories that moving backwards is bad. Orpheus mm -hmm. looks backwards. He loses his love. Mm -hmm. Lot's wife gets turned into a pillar of spices and she is vanquished <laughs> by God. <laughs> <laughs> by the side of Sodom and Gomorrah <laughs> burning <laughs> anyway. So that is, it's really interesting. That's like a great example. Those are old, old stories. Yeah. Um, but something kind of positive, um, if we can pull the labyrinth myth in for a second, is that, you know, Theseus goes into the labyrinth and he's holding the clue, which is just the word for the spool of thread that Ariadne gives him that's tied to like a kind of foot like a door jam on the outside of the labyrinth. And so she gives that to him so that he can retrace his steps when he right. is done slaughtering the poor Minotaur. And I don't know why I care about the Minotaur, but you I love the Minotaur. I love the Minotaur. Okay. So, um, 
he is able to retrace his steps there yeah. uh, and get himself back out. And the labyrinth too is often, you know, in depictions, especially of like super old kind of like Babylonian style labyrinths, they're a circle that looks a lot like a spiral. And mm-hmm. I think that that's the path that the planets put us on, the spiral shape. We've done yes. an episode on the spirals. So we you have. Wanna, if you're inspired by spirals, you can go back and take a listen. But um, yeah, I think that these are moments in story where we see a hero turning backwards. You know, Odysseus also gets kind of like halfway home. And then yeah, he gets, he gets very, very confused. Yep. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's just mm-hmm. actually something that is shown to us that it, it happens and it's not impossible to transgress or to surpass. Mm -hmm. And we have Odin who literally gets inverted. Um, Yes. I wanted to bring that up. Yes. Tell us the Odin story. Yeah. So very, very loosely, um, basically Odin is the, he's like a Zeus equivalent um, in the German uh, pantheon. And he is also, instead of being the God of like thunder, he's like the God of wisdom basically. And so it's sort of, the story sort of goes that he like looks out at the world one day and says, wow, there's so much wisdom out there um, and that I don't have. And I'm the God of wisdom. I, I need to earn the this final bit of wisdom, which is basically the runes. Um, so anybody who works with runes, that's kind of the, the myth that this comes from, um, or one of them at least. And so he goes to Yggdrasil, which is the world tree, and he says to the Norns, um, here I am, and I want to get this wisdom. And they're like, yeah, well, you got to make a sacrifice. Um, so he sacrifices himself by hanging himself upside down on the on Yggdrasil, on the world tree, for nine days and nine nights. And that's not enough. He has to make himself suffer even more. He plucks out an eye. He stabs himself with a spear. Um and this does inevitably win him the the knowledge of the runes. Um, and so we have this inversion of his power. He becomes powerless. He becomes he went he goes from a god that can do everything and has everything in his possession, all the wisdom in his, pos- his possession, to being a body that um, can be can die, right? He suffers. He suffers terribly. Um, This, of course, is very much what inspired the Hangman card, Um, though the Hangman card is also very much a card that represents traitors um, Mm -hmm. in the original tarot. This is is how they killed traitors, so they hung them upside down. That was very common. So when you would be walking along the road to Rome and you saw some dudes hanging upside down, you knew that Mm -hmm. that was the sign that they, they had been traitors, thieves, people the deplorables, basically, of society. Um, and so that we know that it comes from that, but it also comes from this, this you know, especially more developed decks. It comes from this legend of this inversion of our control, the inversion of our power, the ego power, right? The, the, the ability that we're, to think that we're connected to everything, we're on the right path, everything's good. All of a sudden we are completely faulty, fallible. Um, we can be harmed. And we're not as strong as we thought we are. That's the point of the hangman card um, as part of it is to to surrender to that, frankly, as as miserable as that is and sounds, there's I love the hangman card so much because I don't remember which tarot author said this, but I love this, that it's the chariot. The, the charioteer is the hangman, that they're one and the same. And they could be. They have the same coloring and the same like you know, they, they look like they might be the same person and that the charioteer had all this, I'm a God and I'm going after what I want. Um, and then has to hit that point before death where he realizes I'm just a man and I don't know what the frick I'm doing. Um, and he gets hung up and, uh, but the hangman has a nimbus. He has a, a, a Corona. He has a, a halo mm-hmm. and it signifies that even though he's suffering and he's hanging and he's in a state that is it's very pathetic seeming, he's holy, he's blessed, he's having some kind of a numinous, holy experience. And so are we when we're in those states of, I have no idea what's going on, I have no control, I don't know, everything's inverted, everything's going backwards, I don't know who in the world I am right now. Um, it is a holy moment to withstand that. So I think that that's, that's something that we can learn from that Odin story that sometimes we have to sacrifice what it is that we, the wisdom we already think we know in order to get the wisdom that we need 
next. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's what the hangman teaches us too. If we, if we can stop struggling <laughs> for a minute, yeah, that's beautiful. which we're not good at, by the way, listeners, neither yeah. me or Christina are particularly good at any of the things that we talk about. Like we <sighs> know everything about how to live a life. Yeah. I was going to say, yeah, do as I say, not as I do. So. We're very good at thinking very hard about these things and both struggle much in practice. So we're right alongside you trying mm -hmm. to do it all. Yeah, it's really hard work. So, you know, this retrograde season, if you can practice yourself kind of surrendering to the reversal, of course, and seeing what it is that you learn about that discomfort, um, I think is a really great tool for this particular moment. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well said. Should we do a, a dream now? Yes. Let's do a dream. If you're enjoying this podcast, we encourage you to leave a review or learn more about how you can support us on Mighty Networks, where you can get access to some exciting exclusive offerings. Or you can connect with us by sharing a symbolic experience, whether from a dream or synchronicity, for us to explore on the show. Thank you to today's sharer, and please tell us your symbolic experience or connect with us on our website, soarmysticapodcast.com. Are you a small business looking to reach a targeted audience of people interested in all things esoteric? If this sounds like you, Soar Mystica would love to invite you to become an ad partner. We offer a highly tailored audience of mindful, curious, depth-seeking listeners, and we would be delighted to showcase your business and offerings to new hearts and new minds. Simply fill out an advertiser application form at our website, linked in the show notes below, or navigate to soarmysticapodcast.com forward slash advertise with us. I wanted to let everybody know that on August 15th at 11 a.m. PST, 2 p.m. EST, I will be going live with Alyssa Polizzi, who's a dear friend of this podcast and a brilliant Jungian scholar, to discuss everything about archetypal tarot. Um, it's going to be a really exciting, illuminating conversation between the two of us, and this event is free. So if you want to join us, watch it live on Zoom, ask some questions, head over to theartemisian.com, which is Alyssa's platform, and there'll be a link in the show notes as well. So go check out Alyssa's Artemisian. You'll see all the info to sign up for this free event there. And I hope you join, and I hope you ask some great questions, and I'm really looking forward to it. See you there. So this dream is, I had a dream that I was sitting on a couch with a man who I have a romantic connection with, though we haven't yet crossed the threshold into dating. In it, we are sitting on a couch in my bedroom in my family home, which opened out into a field of semi-wilderness. A white cow entered the room, and I got excited because this cow was my friend. He didn't know the cow, but I told him she was friendly and called her over. At first, she reared up on me for a moment like she was going to attack. Then she calmed down and came close to us, and he and I stroked her head happily together. Mm. It's so cute. We got some white cows, and we know that white cows is a, is a thing um, yeah. out there in, in myth land. Yeah, the white cow is super, super mm -hmm. um, like specific and also just very divine as a creature. Yes. So... You know, just to kind of zero in on that image, just to name some things right off the bat, um, I think that, you know, this dream is about like possibility and and yep. hope. Yep. And when I when I hear the white cow, I immediately think of the white cows of Helios, the sun god, um, who that was like his sacred creature that was a sacred animal mm -hmm. um and there's a part of the odyssey where odysseus's men slaughter some of those cattle and they get in big trouble yeah um and then also the um white cow can be zeus or mm -hmm. it can be um europa <laughs> It can be Io. It can be lots of different things having to do with like the transfiguration of people into animals for the sake of a love affair. Mm. Um, and then also the white cow was the sacrificial animal that King Minos asked Poseidon for um, so that he could be beloved by his people in Crete. 
And he was like, Poseidon, give me this beautiful white cow of yours and I will sacrifice it to you. And everybody will know that I'm favored by the gods. And Poseidon was like, cool, sounds like a deal. And then Minos was like, I don't actually want to sacrifice this sacred, beautiful yeah. white cow. It's so pretty. So he kept it. And then Poseidon put a curse on Minos's wife, Pasiphae, causing her to fall in love with the cow. And then she had sex with the cow. And then the, the Minotaur was born. So Minotaur coming up twice today. But um, – yeah, this white cow is just this pure symbol of like a gift of the gods uh, for yeah. whatever reason. Yeah, something so. divine and something that is rare, mm -hmm. that is particularly special because of its if, because of its coloring. It's also, you know, we can think of the whiteness have probably having something to do with divinity and purity. Mm -hmm. um, whiteness generally signifying like, you know, untouched by colors and stuff. And so there's a pure element to it. Um and the cow being a symbol of fertility, probably, mm -hmm. of earth. Um, and in this dream, it's a female cow, it seems, because yeah. she she gendered her she. So um, even more so, I would place it in the realm of being about something that's earthen and fertile feeling. Yeah, very empressy, right? Yes, totally empressy. Mm -hmm. I just looked up pictures of white cows, and they're so cute. <laughs> Do you like cows? Are you a cow yeah. person? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm cool with cows. When when um, my husband and I were in Switzerland, we were in Gruyere, which is a freaking amazing place. Mm -hmm. You would love it. It literally looks like they went there to write um, Beauty and the Beast, the mm -hmm. movie, because it's like almost like a duplicate. There's like a little fountain in the town square. It's very medieval, wow, perfectly still medieval village. Anyway, um, so in Gruyere, we were just like, you have to like walk up this long path to get to the the town. And there's, it's just cattle everywhere, mm -hmm. uh, just like roaming. And there's not even, there's like maybe one fence, one place, but they're just like, they just like bump into you and they're walking. And I was like, whoa, it's <laughs> a lot of free, free roaming ginormous cows right now. Um, I love them. They're they're very cute. They were very cute. They were scary. They're big. They scare me a lot. Yeah, they, they're strong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, man. <laughs> but they're uh, they're sweet. They seem very um, they seem very gentle. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, as creatures, yeah. bulls don't. Bulls are different. Where bulls can be very aggressive, we know that we associate that with them. But cows are generally they in the dream. Even she calls her over and she's like, "Come," mm -hmm. and that's an interesting layer of the dream where the cow kind of rears up and is like, "Am I going to attack you, or am I going to allow you to touch me, pet me, mm -hmm. embrace me, and get some kind of boon from me?" Right? We imagine there's some kind of gift that comes, it's some yeah. kind of godly gift here. Um, I would say that in general, this is an empress dream. I like to do this. This is a little activity I've been doing the last couple of years with my dreams um, is if I see something that feels particularly, has a particular particular archetypal quality, I try to find the card that it's connected to because sometimes it can, it can give yeah. me something to work with. So I would definitely call this an empress dream because you have the cow, but also because the room that you're just sitting on a couch with this person just opens up into wilderness, which of course is the realm of the empress. So, because the the empress is about fertile land and growth and foliage and all that stuff, so I would I would associate that card with that this, dream with that card. Yeah, in the same way that the <laughs> empress is so much about like the you know another way of saying the fertility of the earth, like what you're saying is um, to call it potential, like the yeah. kind of potential of this connection um, with this person who you're dreaming about, and so I think that the dream symbolizes a kind of pureness of heart yeah. around your psyche's vision of what connecting with this person might yield. And so I think if you're like waiting for a symbol or a sign. Yeah, if you're to, waiting for a sign, I mean. This is definitely a good one. A <laughs> Not to pressure you or anything, but if, if we were looking for some good omens, I would say you got one. It's beautiful. And so I think that uh, really taking a heart around that. Um, and there's also something again, like the cow being or the bull being the symbol of Taurus. Yeah. And that is a sign that is so much about um, the grounding nature of one's values. And like, I wonder if there's a shared perspective or a shared connection between the two of you that feels really rich. Yeah. So it seems like you're being shown and encouraged ways of um, feeling good about the connection that you have with this person. And I just think that it feels really promising, like yeah. on its face. So 
I think too, maybe going a little bit deeper, the cow is feminine. Would Mm -hmm. we say that this is like a piece of the feminine psyche that is also speaking through the creature in the dream? It feels like a goddess, honestly. Mm -hmm. It feels like a goddess apparition almost Mm -hmm. in that there's like, it comes in from the wilderness. It's like you're in in a room that's contained, right? You're like in normal territory human territory Mm -hmm. the archetypal realm opens to you the wilderness opens to you you have this emerging deity of some kind this symbol approach that comes in from that archetypal realm and is like am i too am i wild and going to not you know work within your psyche or are you going to be able to adapt me to your psyche and you do you are able to adapt the cow Mm-hmm. to the psyche you're able to reach out and touch it she's you know and she's the fact that you feel that she's a friend to you is also really good and promising like you have an instinct that this is not a dangerous thing these sorts of dreams can definitely represent a new archetypal energy entering you yeah. know the psyche um that there is something awakening maybe this relationship is awakening something about in your feminine consciousness mm-hmm. an- another side of yourself you haven't experienced maybe this this person is a somewhat of an animus figure to you a little bit in a way in which it's allowing you to kind of get in touch with your own more wild power mm-hmm. that there might be an entry point to that too um but i would definitely say whatever feels like it's entering your consciousness right now it's it's a little wild, so it might take some taming, but it's definitely a friend to you, and it's going to help you in some some period of psychological growth. It feels a little bit like the strength card, kind mm-hmm. of too, and that there's like this beast that we have to to reach out for and to meet with gentleness and not with aggression. And it might be a little bit scary at first, but yeah, there's like yeah. that element of the the cow rearing up, and I think that that's also like the natural like um, invocation of, you know, something scary when we're starting a new relationship or a new connection or even a new piece of ourselves opening up. And I think that that's, it's, you're shown in the dream that it's tameable or there's something kind of like soothable about that rearing up. um, That's really important to hold on to as well. So that might be important as a symbol of anxiety or fear, Mm -hmm. or even like your own just ambivalence I don't know but there's something there um that to me says that it's okay to kind of push forward so yeah if you have an altar I would highly recommend getting a picture of a white cow Mm. or I like the one of my analysts years ago gave me this idea of that when I dream of animals to go to the, the like toy store and get like a little a little figurine of the animal. Um, and then you could put that on your altar and maybe paint it white or something. And mm. I would, I would put it somewhere. I would, I would commemorate that, that symbol. I always take it very seriously when animals come into our dream in that really like that really powerful way. Cause it, it's like, it really feels like something big. And so we mm. can kind of create psychic sacred space around that. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. beautiful. I love mm-hmm. that idea. A little sympathetic magic. Mm-hmm. 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 This was a really sweet dream. Thank you for sharing it. Mm-hmm. Um, and thanks for talking to us, talking with us about reversals and retrogrades. And I think our overall message is don't freak out. Mm-hmm. Let it be weird. Let it be hard. And it might be really weird and really hard. Um, do you have any final final warnings for people to not get caught in the craziness of Instagram around retrogrades? You know, just use common sense on the mm-hmm. internet. I think is my only advice. No, I think that um, that is it's, it's advice no one does. So it's, <laughs> it's good advice. It's tough. It's tough. And and listen, stuff does get a little wonky. Like I'm literally here planning a lot of important things for the next month, and it's going to be a Mercury retrograde. So you will, I will be impacted by this transit. I'm sure. So I'm not going to try to you know push it off and say it's not a big deal. But my best retrograde advice is just like check your work check your thoughts check your work yeah double check go back and read it again Mm -hmm. yeah make sure everything is okay and you will be you will be extra secure that way so awesome all right everybody we'll see you in another couple weeks or so and um hold on (laughs) we'll see you then bye thank you for joining us in our conversation today Please consider supporting the podcast by leaving a review and following Soar Mystica wherever you listen.
You can also become a more active supporter and a member of the Soar Mystica community by joining us on our Mighty Networks platform. If you have a symbolic experience that you'd like to share with us for the podcast, you can tell us all about it at soarmysticapodcast.com. The music for this podcast is written and performed by me, Mariana Lewis, with special thanks to Stefan Lewis. You can connect with both Christina and myself on Instagram and get to know our work by clicking on the links in the show notes. As the alchemical motto goes, as above, so below, as within, so without. May this ancient wisdom continue to guide you deeper. Until next time, take good care.